radio turned to 90.1 and if you don't you won't be able to hear me right now and if you're listening to music you're not on the right station but if you're hearing that it really doesn't matter because you're obviously on the right station I'm so glad that each of you have decided to come out and worship I know this is a very different style of worship and since we've been uh, quarantined we've had to uh, experience different styles of worship that we're not used to and some of us might not even like but this is what God has given us this time and uh, I'm just glad that we're still able to proclaim the Word of God even when we're not together on Sunday morning but let's open with a word of prayer and then Jamie is going to come and sing for us let's pray Father God I thank you that you've given us this opportunity to come once again as a church and fellowship with each other from afar Lord thank you for giving us the radio that we can proclaim your message I pray that we have a wonderful service today we ask this in Jesus name Amen
I appreciate Jamie's willingness to come out and sing for us, and it's uh, it's not easy. When I uh, when we first went in quarantine, I preached to a camera and David, and now we get to sing and preach to a bunch of cars. And where's David? Right behind me. Now I don't have David to preach to. I just have a bunch of headlights. But it is a wonderful wonderful to see each and every one of you here and I have a couple announcements so that we are all on the same page as long as the weather as long as the weather is nice as meaning not raining we will be able to do drive-in services as long as the weather is nice we will still do drive-in services we're obviously still recording and we will be pushed to uh, post this on Facebook either tonight or tomorrow but if it's raining, if it is raining, we will not do an outdoor sur drive-in service. One, I'm going to get wet. And two, our equipment will be destroyed. So if it's raining, I will let you guys know. I mean, just look out the window. If it's raining, you know, eh, probably not going to have service. But I will make sure that you know I'll do a call out. So please be aware of that. Also, in July, my family and I will be traveling up north once again. Hopefully we will not get sick, but we'll be traveling up north uh, for vacation. And uh, we will still have services. So just want to let you know about that. But please also know that even when I go on vacation, I'm always a phone call away. If you ever need me or if you ever need to talk to me, just call me, text me, email me, and I will respond. Now, at some of the places I'll be, I don't get good cell reception, but when I get the message, I will respond. I love you guys, and I'm so thankful that you're here today. And right now, we're going to go for another song, but I wanted to let you know that we have our offering plate right over here, that if you brought your offering today, before you leave, feel free to drop the offering in the offering plate, or you can send it in as always. But with that, let's pray for our offering. And then we'll ask Jamie to come up and sing one more time for us. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for this cool breeze. I thank you for this wonderful day. I thank you that we're able to give to you for what you generously blessed us with. Help us to use this money to glorify your name in Anson County and around the world. Help us have a wonderful service today. Help us to clear our minds from any distractions that we may focus on your word and what your word has to say for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Today, the title of my message is The Current Culture and the Current Christian. The Current Culture and the Current Christian. We're not going to be getting into politics today. I do not preach politics. I'm going to preach the Word of God. But there are times when our culture, when our culture is in such a state that it affects how we live as Christians. We cannot be Christians outside of our culture because we are in culture. We, we live in a society. And because of that, it will show in our Christianity. Society, the tensions are on the rise. You read the news and it is doom and gloom. You read the news and things are bad. They are not good right now. There are riots, there are protests, there's pandemics, there's race issues. We are living in a time of division and high tension. You watch the news and you look at a Washington, D.C., and the White House is extending its perimeter fence because tensions are high. In these uncertain times, we must ask ourselves this. Where does a church, or more accurately, where do we as Christians fall? Where does a church, or more accurately, where do we as Christians fall? We cannot put our heads in the sand. We cannot pretend that all is rainbow and sunshine. Where we live in, in Anson, in Wadesboro, on your street, in your house, in your neighborhood, there might not be riots. There might not be protests. If you live somewhere where it's in the middle of the country, you might not see what's going on around you. But that does not mean, that does not mean that it does not affect you. It does, does not affect your home, your household. We must answer this question where does the church or where do we as Christians fall what should we do to answer this question we must first ask and answer two different questions the first one is this can we ignore can we ignore the situation that our friends family neighbors and those around us are facing and still calls our call ourselves good Christians. Secondly, 
Where does our responsibility, if any, lie in protest, social justice, and inequality? Where does our responsibility lie? Today, I'm going to look at how the Bible answers these three questions. This is not my opinion. I'm not giving you what I think we should do. This is what the Word of God says on how we should respond to these three questions. Let's pray for God to give us guidance through this. Father God, as we open your Word, I pray that you open our ears, open our hearts to what your Word has to say. Let us put aside our political affiliations. Let's put aside our personal feelings, our personal prerogatives. And let's put your word first and foremost in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I uh, started today, David, Jamie, and I prayed for a good service. And I said, you know, we're using different aspects of technology. We have different wires going everywhere. We're at the mercy of the weather. And that God is going to use us. But Satan is going to try to attack us. And my voice has been fine all week. And up until I came up here to preach. And now my voice is starting to strain. So I, if it cracks, I pray that you forgive me. I'm sorry for that. Today we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 10, verses 27 through 37. Luke chapter 10, verse 27 through 37. And we all know this story, the Good Samaritan. But before we get there, we need to answer this question. Can we ignore the situations that our friends, family, neighbors, and those around us are facing and still call ourselves good Christians? And I put that word good there because anyone can call themselves a Christian. My dog Lily, I can say, is a Christian dog. That does not make her a Christian. That's just a title I've given her. What I'm talking about is being a good Christian, a Christian that follows the Word of God, a Christian that tries to apply the Word of God in every aspect of their life. A good Christian. Can we ignore the situation that those around us are facing and call ourselves good Christians. So what are the situations that people are facing? What are people dealing with? Well, racial inequality and hatred. We are a nation divided. There's always been racism. And when President Obama got elected in office, we thought for sure racism would disappear. But that is not the case. In fact, racial tensions have only increased and not decreased. There's racial inequality and hatred towards others, towards groups of people, and even towards government entities. You look at the protests right now, they're saying defund the police. We don't want the National Guard to help us with the riot. They're hating groups of people for no other reason than their own prerogatives. There's racial inequality in our country. There's hatred in our country. Not only is there racism, not only is there hatred, there's also sickness. COVID-19, the Rona, it's there. North Carolina's cases have only risen. Now, some people are saying, well, it's uh, Soros. It's Bill Gates. They're behind it. It's China. It doesn't matter who's behind it. People are getting sick. People are dying. We've been quarantined. I'm preaching to a parking lot. There is sickness. And with this sickness, it's the stress of the unknown. People are dealing with high amounts of stress because of this disease. Then there's injustice. People are saying, I'm being treated unjustly. People are being unjustly handled. What does the Bible say about all this? What does the Bible say? 
Well, look at racial inequality. The reality is, is we are all one family. The Bible says that we came from Adam and Eve. Beyond that, we came from Noah. Genesis 9.1 says that when Noah left the ark, God said, be fruitful and multiply. We all are brothers and sisters, cousins, distant cousins, very distant cousins. Crazy amount of cousins, but Lewis, you and I, we're related. We are all from the same family tree. So why is there racism? Because we do not understand the word of God. We don't understand that we're all one family. In Christ, we are all one. Outside of the general world, Christian, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 and 28, it says that there's no Jew, no Greek, no Roman, no Gentile. They're all one in Christ. We are the family of God. There should be no racism in Christianity. Hatred towards others and people. Hatred is murder. 1 John 3.15 talks about that if you hate your brother, if I as a believer hate another Christian, I am guilty of murder. If we hate someone, we are guilty of murder. It also talks about unbelievers. 1 John 4.20 says that when we don't love others, but we say we love God that we are liars. How can you love God who you haven't seen and hate another human who you have seen? It doesn't work. You can't hate someone and love God. Hatred is murder and for a believer hatred is a lack of love of God. We are image bearers of God. We bear the image of God. Every human in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, God said, let us make man in our image. We are image bearers of God. Every human you see bears the image of the almighty creator. How can you hate that? How can you look at grass and the little flower and say, this is beautiful? That's not made in the image of God, but look at something that's made in the image of God and say, I hate that. You can't. You cannot hate as a Christian. Look at sickness. What does the Bible say about sickness? How do we handle those who are sick? With prayer and medicine. Prayer and medicine. Jesus gave us prayer and doctors. This idea that Jesus is enough. I don't need no medicine. Jesus is enough. That's crazy talk. Jesus gave you prayer and faith, but he also gave you Advil and Tylenol. If you break your leg, you don't call Lewis, Kevin, Tony, and myself and say, can you pray over my broken leg? I'll be good. Just pray over it. No. You say, hey, I broke my leg. Can you pray for me? I'm at the doctor right now. God gave us medicine. James chapter 5, verse 14 and 15 says, When you're sick, call the leaders of the church together and have them pray for you and anoint you with oil. The reason they say anoint with oil is that was their medication. They used oil for medication. They didn't have Tylenol. They didn't have Advil. They had essential oils. And they would douse the wound with oils to purify it. What James was saying is pray for healing but use common sense as well. So how do we deal with sickness? With prayer and medication. How do we deal with the stress of this COVID situation? Prayer and faith. Philippians 4.13 says I can be content in all things when it says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, it's talking about contentment. I can be content no matter what situation because I know who's in charge. The reality is, the reality that we are facing as believers is very simple when it comes 
to racism, sickness, hatred. When it comes to those things, we rely on the Word of God. We cannot ignore the situations that our family, friends, neighbors are facing. We need to stand out. We need to love and we need to have faith. It is our responsibility. And second question is, can we ignore the situations that our, friendly, that our family, friends are facing? Look at the Good Samaritan. Look at what the Good Samaritan, the story says. Turn with me to Luke chapter 10, verse 27. Luke chapter 10, verse 27 through 37. So he answered and said, he's talking to a lawyer right now, Jesus was asked, you know, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus responded, what are the greatest commandments in the Old Testament? And he, the, the lawyer said, he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God, and this is Luke chapter 10, verse 27, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? This question, who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down to Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came, looked, and passed on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. The Good Samaritan, a wonderful story about how we should behave as Christians. So let's look at this story in depth. A neighbor is in need. This person traveling was going 19 miles from Jerusalem to Jericho, 19 mile journey. Now that doesn't seem far. I go to Rockingham, I go many places more than 19 miles in the morning. But this is walking. Walking one mile, mm, that's easy. Two miles, hey, we're pushing it. Three miles, why am I walking three miles? Why in the world am I walking three miles? I have a car. But at this time, they didn't have cars. This guy was on an, a long journey. He was a Jew. He was robbed. And when he was robbed, he had no more money. He had nothing of value. He was stripped of anything of value. Not only was he robbed, he was wounded. Now his helpless, helpless failing, and he was unable to help himself. He could no longer go on his journey. He didn't have a bruise, he wasn't sore, he was left for dead. He was left to die, he was alone, and he was in need. He was without hope, he was without help, he was without help, he was going to die. It was the end. He was a lost cause. And then a priest came by, and a Levite, not together, separately, but a priest and Levite came by. They were coming, most likely, from Jerusalem to Jericho, because that was one of the Levitical cities where priests and Levites lived. They were just finished serving in the temple of God. They knew the law. They served God. They were well respected. And they saw the man. 
they saw a man in need. They saw that he was hurt. They saw that he'd been robbed. They saw that his help was failing. And what did they do? They avoided him. They saw the need. They kept him at a distance. It wasn't like, oh, I think there's someone in need over there. No. It was like, oh, hey, yeah, step away. That person looks kind of rough. And they avoided him. They went out of their way to keep him at a distance. They went out of their way to keep his problems at a distance. They kept their lives separate from his. Their opinion was, not my problem. That's going to cost me physically, financially, and emotionally. The cost to me is too high. I'm not going to get involved. I have too much to lose, I am too important, I come first over them. Good luck. Then a Samaritan came by. Who is a Samaritan? The lowest of society. The lowest on the rung of society. He saw the same need, hurt, robbed, his help was failing. He had every reason to ignore this person. He had every reason to say, you know what? I've been there, done that, you know, good luck. He looked at himself, he's the lowest of the low. He might not want to help. This person was a Jew, they hated Samaritans. And so he's like, why should I help my enemy? It will cost me time, it will cost me physically, emotionally, monetarily. He looked at the person and he had compassion. He had compassion. He did not care about all his excuses. He did not care that he would have to walk the rest of the way instead of ride. He did not care that it would cost him an unknown amount of money. It's easy to help someone with money when you know it's 20 bucks. But when it's an unknown sum, that's different. He did not care. He did not care about the emotional toll it would take on him. He did not care about anything. He had compassion. He cared about the person, not the situation. He cared about the person. He cared about the injustice. He cared about mercy. He cared about Filling the need. He cared about filling the need. At the very end, Jesus, after he tells a story, he said, we are to do the same. We are commanded to be the Samaritan. It's not a choice. We are to do the same. We are to be the good Samaritan. We are not to care about all the excuses of why not to help someone. We are not to care about all the reasons why this is a bad time, or why this is going to cost me so much money, or why this is going to ruin my plan. He might have been saving up for a new donkey. He might have saw the latest donkey, Donkey 2.0, and he was like, man, those ears are nice and long. This would be a great donkey. I'm going to save up. I'm going to buy this donkey. And then he saw this man with a need. He didn't say, well, I can't. I'm buying donkey 2.0. He didn't say that. He said, whatever the need is, I'm going to fill it. He told the innkeeper, whatever he spends money-wise, whatever the cost, I will cover it. He gave the, the sick man, the Jew, a blank check. He didn't say, well, only order food from the kids' menu. Only get day-old bread. No. He said, whatever you need, it's covered. He didn't care. He saw a need, knew he could fill the need, and he filled it. He put his personal wants, desires behind him, and we are told to do the same. Why? We're to care about the person. The person is who we're supposed to care about, not the situation. 
We're to care about injustice. We're to care about mercy. We're to care that a need is filled. Our job as believers is to care that a need is being filled, that people are cared for, that justice is being carried out, that mercy is being shown. Where, this leads us to answer the question, where does a church, or more accurately, where do we as Christians fall? In our current culture, where do we as Christians fall? Christians have multiple responsibilities. Matthew 28 says we're to spread the gospel. James 1, 27 says we're to care for the needy. Micah 6, 8, Luke 10, 27 to 37 says we're to care about justice and mercy. We as believers should be leaders in society justice, in social justice. We as believers should be beacons of hope, love, and comfort in our communities. We as believers should stand against injustice and abuse. People ask, where is the church? Where is the church in all this? Where is the church in social justice? Where is the church in love? Where is Pleasant Grove? Where are they? That is the wrong question. The question is, where is the church? The question is, where are the Christians? Where are the Christians? Because the Christians make up the church. If the Christians were doing the job of social justice, loving, mercy, and caring for one another, the question would never rise, where is the church? They would see us. They would see all of us. They don't see the church because they don't see us being Christians. Being a good Samaritan means that we follow the Lord's command to love mercy, to love justice, and to help those in need. To help those in need. So what do we do? So what do we do? We first, must help those who need it. We must stand for equality. We must stand for justice. When we do not, when we do not see these in our society, when we don't see mercy, when we don't see equality, when we don't see justice, we must take action. We cannot sit still. We cannot ignore it. We cannot put our hand in the sand and say, rainbows and sunshine. We cannot say that. We must take action. Be it a peaceful protest. Be it in our voting. Be it in other lawful expressions. Be it in, and this is key, be it in our everyday interactions with others. See, protests are good. As long as they follow the law, a peaceful protest is a good thing. There's a protest at the corner of uh, Food Lion and Burger King. And it was peaceful. I have no problem with that, because if they take the rights of a church away, say, I can't preach the word of God, I'll protest it. As long as it's a peaceful protest, there's nothing wrong with that. In our voting, we should vote what the Word of God says we should vote. In other lawful expressions, we have a right to our opinion. But the key is, the key isn't in protest, it isn't in voting, it isn't in lawful expression, it's in everyday interactions with others. People can see you protest on a Saturday, but when you go and use racial slurs on Monday, that's what they're going to see. You may say, I love others I don't hate on Sunday, but on Monday when you go to work and you hate your co-workers, that's what they're going to see. The reality is, 
If we want to be good Christians, we need to love justice, love mercy, love others, love equality, and it should be seen in our everyday interactions with others. But action must take place. We cannot keep silent. We cannot ignore this. We must act as good Samaritans. Today, my question for you is this. Are you a good Samaritan? Are you a good Samaritan? Or are you sitting on the sidelines? Are you keeping everything at a distance? Because you don't want to get your hands dirty. Are you a good Samaritan today? Let's pray. Father God, the answer to the questions is not a revolution. It is not some major action, but it's in everyday interactions with others, loving others because they bear your image helping others when they are in need with no thought except their need loving mercy loving justice loving equality help that to be seen in our everyday interactions if it is not convict us if someone here today is saying john i'm not doing those things let them where they are confess that they are not good Christians, that they're just playing the part. And let them come to you and say, Father, help me, show me how to be a good Samaritan. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming today. I hope you enjoyed it. Please feel free to tell me what you thought about today's service being a drive-in service. I hope you enjoyed it, and don't forget this Wednesday at 6 o'clock on Facebook and on YouTube, we're going to be looking at the Apostles' Creed, we're going to go through a little bit more of the Apostles' Creed, I hope you enjoy it, and once again, thank you for coming, and have a wonderful rest of your day.